In this episode of Suspect Zero, the case of George Waterfield Russell, a.k.a. The Charmer. Welcome to episode two of Suspect Zero. I'm Dawn Washburn, a true crime teacher in New Jersey, and joining me is my co-host, Dr. Michael Arntfield, an expert on true crime in Canada. Hi, Michael. Hey, Dawn. How's things going in NJ? Going. I'm not sure how well they're going, but they're going. <laughs> So, Michael, why don't you open up the discussion on why this podcast is so unique and why we started talking about the fact that we should do it? Right. So for years, people, same as you, we teach true crime. Uh, I mean, you're in a a large um, high school system. I'm at a large university and people have been saying, you know, why don't you you dip your toe into this whole podcasting um, zeitgeist and I guess I was always of the mind, I needed something new to, to offer and I needed a good co-host and it was serendipitous that we met actually. But the, the angle, the, the, the sort of branding of this podcast is, and it's all in the name, Suspect Zero, which has nothing to do with the now pretty obscure uh, film from the, from the mid-2000s of the same name. It has nothing to do with that. This is uh, a show about uh, homicides, murder, serial murder, whereby they're either solved or they're cold cases, but they have one thing in common, which is they are lesser known, perhaps the least known of cases that everybody should have known about by now, but for whatever reason, uh, generally don't. So the zero denotes either a solved case that has zero media footprint and that no one's ever heard of, or an unsolved cold case whereby there is zero clue on who the suspect is, a real whodunit. And what we're going to do is um, develop some kind of suspect profile while we hash it out. But I think it's important that we start by looking at, first of all, a solved case that has had comparatively, like everyone talks about Bundy. I mean, Bundy gets recycled all the time and, you know, Manson and Ramirez, and it's the same names all the time. And in reality, uh, the most, I think, comp- well, they're all compelling, but I mean, in- incredibly teachable cases whereby we can learn so much about forensics and in criminal investigative procedure and profiling and paraphilia and all the terms we're going to be unpacking as, as part of this show. These cases have stayed in the shadows. Again, zero name recognition. So I thought it was important that we start with a, a solved case that, again, had that zero um, attention until now. And we can use it to, I think, talk about some very important and, t- and timely issues. Agreed. And I think it's important also for our students, um, because a lot of times when I go into my serial killer unit, it, they always um, associate it with exactly the names that you mentioned. Yep. <laughs> so, and to be honest, sometimes it's a little bit uh, droning to keep teaching about them and to glorify what they've done. So I, I always preface my classes with, listen, we have to give respect to the victims first and foremost, you know, that is, that is always um, at the forefront of anything that we discuss, because I never want my students to think that, you know, we are ever discussing a serial killer in terms of anything that we should show respect for that person. That's not what it's about. And a lot of them want to be glorified or wanted to be glorified. So by you pointing out the ones who haven't been, um, I also think it's important to show the students there's other realms in, in crime that need to be discussed, that they need to be looking at. So whether we talk about a cold case that hasn't been solved or we talk about a case that has been solved, um, it's it's a good profile to begin with so that they can even understand in their daily lives who they're dealing with. Yeah, and again, another um, footnote, these killers that we're bringing into the light that again, I've had zero name recognition so now, we're not looking to make them to lionize them, to make them famous. I mean, uh, listeners and viewers can look up my background and know, I mean, I was a cop for 15 years. I'm a a huge victim advocate. And uh, this is really about using these lesser known cases that, again, I mentioned are teachable moments to avoid being a victim, to know how to recognize psychopaths who try to infiltrate your life. Uh, Again, these these touchstones of true crime just keep coming up again. 
these, uh, these names, uh, there's no, only so many ways you can tell a story about the BTK or, or about John Wayne Gacy. So let's look at some lesser known cases and the value that those cases impart for criminology as a discipline, but also for everyday life in terms of how to avoid being a victim. Because again, this is a victim centric podcast versus, uh, I mean, a lot of stuff that's out there is, is just absolute trash and, and, and again, glamorizes and celebritizes killers, which um, falls into a specific disorder and what we call a paraphilia uh, called hybristophilia, which we're going to talk about in a few weeks. So um, we could go on and on. We're catching up. We haven't talked in a while, Don, but why don't you uh, tell us about this week's crime and, and killer and we'll, we'll take it from there. So you kind of shed light on someone that I never even heard of before. And I guess that's the point. So I, I really had to do some extensive research and figuring out what this person was like, um, what his MO was, how he got started. Uh, so I learned quite a bit, you know, but in the interim, I also want you to teach me the rest of it because I feel like I need to know more. And I feel like this will tie to a lot of, um, a lot of people we kind of know, you know, he almost seems as though he's someone that people could know. And that's scary, you know? So our first, um, our first episode is going to be focused on George Waterfield Russell Jr., otherwise known as the Charmer, the East Side Killer, the Bellevue Killer. Um, he has an extensive uh, rap sheet <laughs> um, of petty theft. And um, really, honestly, I find the biggest thing with him is that he was able to charm people so well that he really... Uh, had people hoodwinked. And so give me your take on him and then I'll add what I sort of, you know, looked into and read about. Yeah, well, I mean, you can get to, and you can outline his crimes that we know of, uh, the murders that he committed. But I mean, it's interesting you mentioned the, the charmer and this, on the surface, this seems like, like someone we've all met and we have, that's, that's the point, the charmer. We've all met and had our lives infiltrated by people who are superficially charming, which is uh, among the hallmarks of a psychopath. And again, not all psychopaths are necessarily homicidal, but uh, they will wreak havoc and do damage in the lives of everybody that they come across. And um, that's how they acquire victims, whether they be victims of financial crime, whether they be victims of infidelity, whether they be victims of emotional or physical abuse, or in this case of, of, of murder, um, that is how they disarm people. We are all sort of hardwired, engineered genetically. <clears throat> I mean, 99 point, I think five or six percent of all humans have a, a common ancestor and we all come from that. Over the years, uh, our body has learned our bodies have learned to adapt to our physical environments and um, we recognize predators it's within our DNA to, re to, to do that this is why the human eye recognizes uh, different shades of green more than any other color that's that's a, a direct inheritance from our ancestors on the savanna who needed to be able to see predators camouflaging themselves that's why hormones like cortisol and adrenaline you know, pump into your blood when you are under stress because that is a fight or flight mechanism that has taught us how to survive over the years. And that's normally when we see an overt predator, what we do, we our defense mechanisms that have been honed over thousands of years of evolution kick in. Psychopaths have learned to circumvent that and uh, they use, uh, you know, ingratiating language and superficial charm and they're often very attractive and all these things that allow us to let our guard down and let these people in and that's exactly what he did and with disastrous consequences and it's always disastrous with psychopaths but in this case when you have a psychopath who's also a necrophile or someone who's attracted to dead bodies sexually and places great sexual importance and, and fantasy value on death and cause in death I mean, can you imagine, uh, I mean, those two things coming together, it's like nu a nuclear reaction, basically. There, there's no way that that's not going to result in, in somebody's death. Now, I want to go back to something that you stated because, um, so as a woman, 
you know, I put myself in the place of meeting him at these bars and we'll get into the story of really, but I just want to make a, a point. Um, so, you know, he would frequent bars. I mean, if, and I wanted to put myself in the place of the victim so that I could feel what I would feel if I met him and, and how he would charm me. Um, now, because I teach true crime now, I'm very <laughs> aware of these things. So now it's a little bit more, I'm more on the, uh, on guard. However, um, meeting him for the first time, uh, and the way that he sort of would make a woman feel protected really is what kind of reeled me in because every woman wants to feel protected by a man. I mean, not every woman, but most women, I mean, that's a, a huge part of, of, you know, joining forces, I think is just to feel that, you know, you're safe. Um, and so he would emit that element. He would emit that emotion to them. And right. that's, I think, where they got hooked. He would act as though he was protecting them from the serial killer when inadvertently he was the serial killer. So that's something, you know, this is all a psychological game that he was playing. So I just wanted to make that point before we went on and, and got into the, the story about it, because, again, I, I want to. I want to be the the on the victim's side and feeling what they felt and not necessarily the ones who um, were murdered, but also the victims that he met in life who he victimized but didn't murder. So and that's an important distinction. I mean, the when sort of narrowing down podcast um, sort of themes, one idea that I had for a true crime series or a book or and this is I've had this idea for years. It's very difficult to track these people down. One idea I had was you always hear about bodies being found by hunters or fishermen or people that are walking their dog and, you know, the victims of, you know, uh, you know, the Green River Killer, Gary Leon Ridgeway. I mean, tons found in the woods by people minding their own business. These people are victims too. Can you imagine stumbling across a mutilated body of a, a, a child, for instance? What happens to those people after that? We always hear about these people, you know, minor rumors, this body was eventually discovered in this state by a person. And those are the players in these crimes that you never hear about again and have never been paid any attention. And they are sort of, number one, unsung heroes because their discoveries often lead eventually to the arrest of people who until that point had successfully concealed bodies so they aren't found, what we call disposal pathway number one, and I'll talk about that uh, in subsequent episodes. But where do they go from there? How do you move on in life after, number one, having that important a role to play in some of these key crimes? But number two, a lot of these people have never seen a dead body before, and they stumble across among the most horrific atrocities committed in peacetime you know, on this continent. It's, it's, those are victims too. And that's interesting that you make that distinction is that serial killers have far more victims than uh, the names attributed to their, to their crimes as, as victims of murder. Their families are victims, their neighbors and coworkers are victims, the people who find their bodies are victims. Um, to go to the case of, we'll talk about this case in a few weeks, the toolbox killers, um, the lead, I don't want to divulge too much at this point, but the lead uh, investigator in that case committed suicide, left a, a, a lengthy suicide note about how the, that case essentially um, wrung any, any happiness he might have in life uh, again out of him. Uh, a number of the jury members uh, were uh, you know, in therapy for years and the tapes, the audio recordings of what these killers did were later used actually to emotionally and psychologically desensitize FBI agents. So um, wow. <clears throat> socially engineer them for the worst of the worst because they were that impossible to listen to, the, the, the damage that they caused. So again, serial killers have a wide array of victims. Psychopaths generally have a wide array of victims. And uh, some names are obviously very easily linked to them. Many aren't and are uh, unrecognized victims. Well, that's what I, you know, when I was uh, reading up on this particular person, I, I stumbled on a few of the women that he had either dated or, you know, he, he seemed to be someone who would deny his African-American heritage, although he would use it as a card later on. Um, who does that so, remind you of? Another psychopath. 
quote unquote, there's a quote, I'm not black, I'm OJ. Wow. That's, he, that, that was, he was initially very reluctant to um, the defense that was successfully used by, principally by Johnny Cro Cochran. The American crime story series, The People vs. O.J. Simpson, is very accurate in terms, that's a great series by the way, if anybody's true crimed out on the usual stuff, if you have not already seen that, that first season of the anthology series American Crime Story, that very accurately depicts the fact that O.J. did not see himself as any race, which in a way is I guess a good attitude. I mean, everyone is forced to see in color, especially these days, but um, eventually race became a key cornerstone of, of that defense. And initially, for the reasons you mentioned, he did not identify and deny the fact that that was his, his heritage. So interesting, that immediately jumped out at me in terms of the parallels between the two cases. One being, both being psychopaths, uh, one being a uh, double murder, one being a serial killer. Sorry to interrupt. Go on. <laughs> oh, no. So, Mike, why don't we let's go back for our listeners. Let's go back to the beginning a little bit um, because they're going to need to know what we're talking about and we're, they're going to need to know a little bit of the history of of this particular person. So I'm going to leave that beginning to you and then I'm going to come in and tell you what I what I sort of um, researched along the way. But I think it's important to just give, let's give the background of George Waterfield Russell and, you know, his, his story, his beginnings. Well, I mean, he had a pretty much unremarkable uh, on the surface uh, childhood and adolescence, other than, again, you mentioned uh, that he um, had some early quote unquote petty crimes. Well, I think we need to get around that. First of all, everyone's hung up on this idea, and this has been popularized uh, by some recent true crime series uh, and Netflix series that, you know, all serial killers start by, uh, you know, torturing animals or mutilating animals. Well, sexual sadists start out that way because that's part of their, their formative, uh, their, their sexual awakening involves excitement, sexual excitement in the, in the pain, suffering, and humiliation of, of creatures they can control and it goes from insects to animals to usually small children to then uh, preferred victims. But um, there are other types of embryonic future offenders who start with property crimes and uh, breaking and entering for instance which uh, the charmer did, uh, we now recognize there's seven sexually motivated types of burglary. Um, and we see these, we see elements of, of that show up in, again, Richard Ramirez's crimes, the Golden State Killer's crimes, where something is often taken and where they started, you know, as, as burglars. But the objective is not to take, you know, back then the VCR or, or a gun or, or some jewelry. It's the excitement of intrude, entering someone's life, having that control, uh, you know, having ownership of their photos, their bedroom. Uh, and really, this is a rehearsal for the crimes yet to come. The difference in the Charmer's case is that he was, uh, unlike someone like Ramirez, um, superficially charming enough, good looking enough that he could actually go out and put on a public face and uh, pick women up. He did not have to, like the Golden State Killer, break in uh, while they were sleeping, which is again a whole other disorder called somnophilia, which usually begins with peeping or, or uh, what we call hot prowl B and E's, where someone will break in and watch or film someone sleeping. Um, the charmer was able to infiltrate people in their social circles and, and acquire victims very, uh, very quickly compared to other offenders who usually start, for instance, with people on the margins, sex trade workers, um, you know, homeless people, uh, hitchhikers, and sort of it's I mean it sounds terrible but essentially work their way up to hone their skills and work their way up to their preferred victims their sort of fantasized victims whereas he was able to very quickly jump over like leap forward and immediately begin acquiring victims at bars sort of from his own peer group which uh, remark shows I mean a tremendous and expeditious progression through sort of his criminal his serial killing career Right. And so for, I mean, his beginnings are, are a typical, you know, he, he didn't have, he was, he was, I would say emotionally neglected as a child. 
So his mother left when he was six months old um, and left him with his grandmother to raise him. So he essentially grew up with his four aunts um, who acted as though they were his sisters, but they they actually helped to raise him. Um, And then his mother remarries and she uh, comes back to get him and she has a, a new daughter now. And so he was kind of forgotten you know, if we want to give a little bit of his history. So one could argue that his background dictated one that would be predisposed to being, you know, someone who who would lead a life of crime or, you know, someone who was who was neglected or didn't have that bond with his mother, you know, so that was the whole, that was the beginnings. And then when his mother married, you know, when she was remarried to this dentist, they moved into more of an affluent area where he would, um, frequent bars with, with, you know, white women, black, with everyone, but he, he kind of disowns the black women in a way, because he really wanted to fit in with the more white affluent, uh, people, his age. And the problem was they sort of rejected him. Um, you know, he would, he would become friendly, but then he would sort of also be the leader of the younger kids. He would be the leader of them because that's who he could control. He couldn't control right. the kids with the BMWs and the, you know, he couldn't keep up, but he tried to. The, the thing that I find amazing is later on, he, st- he was saying that he did not, that the police should stop honing in on his childhood, that he had a great childhood and that uh, his mother did what she had to do. She was going to be a professor in a college. And why shouldn't she go better herself and leave me when I'm six months? You know, that that's what she needed to do to be to be better. So he completely debunks the idea of his childhood being what catapulted him into what he's doing, what he was doing that, you know, what he did. Um, so I think that was important to point out. And also um, something that he was quoted saying a little bit later in in life uh, was that people in lighted houses can't see out their windows. That's important to remember. So as he was gaining this little life of crime, he started learning along the way, but he was also working with police officers. He, the police officer saw him as a troubled kid and took him in and said, hey, you know, why don't you answer phones and do things? So he started learning very early on what police look for and how they and he also used that when he met women. He would say, I work with the police. So they, again, coming back to that protection thing, they felt protected by him and they wanted him around. Um, but little did they know he was learning about them. He was learning them a lot. And 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 that sort of led him to um, resenting women (laughs) as well. Yeah, the police sort of uh, fanboying and um, shadowing is is common among necrophiles, most notably uh, Edmund Kemper, the co-ed killer who frequented cop bars, wanted to be a cop, um, you know, didn't have any sort of real role uh, other than being just someone who sat at the bar and listened to cops tell stories or who cops would vent to, but he absorbed it all the same way um, the charmer did. So to go back quickly, I mean, you mentioned the co- he didn't want the cops to dwell on his childhood. And that's why I said he had a, a, an unremarkable childhood. I mean, it's not a conventional childhood, right. but uh, we know that some kind of childhood trauma is, uh, whether it be abandonment, abuse, neglect, uh, is ultimately the crucible in which these these disorders known as paraphilias, which are um, disordered or dangerous uh, sexual preoccupations or attractions to unusual and in many cases illegal people, places, things, sounds, sights, etc., including necrophilia, which is very difficult to have um, as a sexual impulse and not commit crimes, whether it be grave robbing or killing people to have to acquire a, a fresh dead corpse to have uh, sexual relations with. So, um, so something happened. But in the grand scheme of serial killers who have had you know tremendously um, nomadic childhoods, abusive childhoods, uh, there, there's no obvious thing that sticks out. It's unconventional. His mother left to for selfish reasons. And obviously between then and when she came back to reclaim him, he developed um, these impulses uh, and obviously psychopathic traits to be a survivor. And then when he was re sort of um, integrated into this comparatively affluent community, he 
had the skills to, to out hustle these other hustlers and was intent on doing it, which explains why, again, he makes that, he leapfrogs immediately to, to targeting people in his own peer group or people he aspired to be. Maybe you can talk about uh, the victims because the listeners will want to know what the crimes are. We only know of, of three confirmed victims, by the way. We only know of three. So, um, so the first one was Mary Ann Polreich, who was found uh, by a dumpster laid out, sort of like uh, she was laying in a coffin. Um, and she was found by one of the restaurant employees who came out to dump the trash. And there she was laying next to the dumpster. Um, but it's also known that he had worked at that restaurant and was fired. So, uh, you know, laying her there was really, really a, a huge signature and, and a huge message. And I think that's a large portion of why he wanted to do what he the way that he laid it out, the way that he did it was was his 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 message, not only to the police, but that to the community. Like, you're going to reject me. But guess what? I've outsmarted you. And, and there was almost a narcissism in that in his in his personality, you know, just to believe that he could get away with that. Well, and that narcissism, along with superficial charm is, um, you know, inherent in, in, in all psychopaths. And what's interesting there is that choice of disposal location, as we call it, um, has both what we call instrumental and expressive properties. So it was expressive in that you're right. It sent some kind of message. It was it, it appeased sort of some need he had to defile that place, perhaps. Um, I would obviously shock again people who just who find bodies. Whatever happened to the busboy or, or, or right. waitress or employee that, that found this body and haunted them forever. So that is expressive. That is something known only to him. And he got something from that that, um, you know, was not necessarily part of the MO, but again, as you mentioned, part of the signature, something unique to that offender. Whereas there's also something instrumentally uh, appealing about that location to him in that he would know from working there that at certain times, uh, number one, employees aren't going to be out there. Maybe that's if employees want to leave to smoke, they don't use that door. He would know from taking out the trash, for instance, that no one parked back there. So it offered concealment and discretion that he needed in order to spend prolonged time with the body post-mortem in order to pose it in this funereal uh, coffin-like pose, which is, again, a, a hallmark of a necrophile in that he will, that will have been... That would have been a brain movie that he would have replayed, I mean, probably still does, of the, the sight of that poor young girl uh, posed like she's in a coffin sitting, you know, but she's on the, the asphalt of a parking lot behind a dumpster. She so. was only 27 years old and she was strangled, but what also kind of um, threw me was that he had put a pine cone in her hands while she was laying in this coffin like and you know they couldn't figure out the um the logistics of that why why a pine cone but i i feel like it was something that was just nearby that almost like holding a bouquet or holding something in your hands or you know it was just the prop that he found close right. and prop. nearby. that's exactly it and right. so it was a, a a prop of opportunity but that image will have been in his mind and been a fantasy for some time and he may have been to, to funerals or again, we know that I don't get too much into this, but funeral crashing or going to funerals is um, of people you don't know just to survey bodies. We know is, again, another preparatory activity among necrophiles, including homicidal necrophiles. Not all are homicidal, but uh, again, uh, they're aroused and fascinated by it. So the fact that he intuitively, again, someone could have exited that restaurant or driven up unpredicted and caught him doing this but the risk of taking the time to to put the pine cone in her hand pose her like this was worth the reward visually and sexually that he got from it so right away when that body was found the police should have known they were dealing with a homicidal necrophile who was for sure going to go serial because you don't just do that once I agree with that. And, and honestly, in trial later on, which I was going to get to later, but it, it kind of the opportunity came up. But in trial later on, um, there was a there was a, an argument over and John Douglas, who, you know, was the FBI profiler. He's 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 got a big name. Um, he was in a constant battle in court about whether the difference between staging and posing. And I found this very interesting to, you know, 
the difference. And, and I learned something from this, although I know what the words mean, you know, I didn't really apply that to, to somebody murdering people and what they do, but he made a great point that when you stage something, you want to throw the investigation off. You're making it look as though someone robbed somebody when they really didn't, you're staging the scene. But when you're posing a body, there's a completely different different meaning in that. And, and hence where you come in with, with George Russell being somebody who wanted those bodies posed to send the message that he wanted to send, you know, it, it was, it was a very purposeful, um, way that he, that he had posed these bodies. And I'll get into that in a second. So let me get to my, the second victim. Um, so the second victim was, uh, Carol Beathy, who was found in her bed, uh, beaten with bite marks and plastic over her head and positioned with, uh, she posed with right. r- red high heels on. Um, and you know, an object, I believe it was a shotgun shoved into her vagina, um, which made it even more, you know, just gruesome, you know? And, okay. And then we have our third victim, Andrea Levine, um, who again, sexual in nature, uh, shoves a dildo in her throat she puts in her hands now we're veering away from the pine cone now we have a book um more joy of sex in her hands um and and a ring that later on becomes the the central focus of this investigation but a ring that was missing from the scene an amethyst ring that was on her on her hand uh so Michael, you are the expert in this. Why don't you talk about, you know, the objects and the, you know, the, you know where to go with that. <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, you raise a good point between posing and staging. And unfortunately, the terms are still used interchangeably, even among law enforcement. Staging is you are creating a tableau intended to misdirect investigators. Like you said, looked like, you know, a, a robbery uh, gone wrong. Well, I mean, there's seldom do those two ideas go together. Often a robbery ending in a homicide is a robbery gone right. Uh, and we'll talk about robbery as a, as a sexually motivated homicide or as a, as a mechanism for sexually motivated homicide in a few weeks. Um, basically every episode of Columbo for our listeners ever began with a crime that was staged. And that really is sort of the, the whole crux of that series, which is great, which is only Columbo can see um, the crime for actually what it was. It's not a burglary, it's not a robbery, it's, it's not a struggle. Uh, and he, he can very clearly zero in on, on motive and these forensic countermeasures being used to, to try to throw off police. Uh, posing, by contrast, so staging, think Columbo episodes. Posing, think uh, sex crimes, which is that there is, again, additional time being spent at the scene interacting with the victim post-mortem, potentially leaving additional evidence. But again, there is something so gratifying and empowering about the image that you're creating with the body. And it could be severe mutilations. It could be something like, again, putting it into either a humiliating uh, or very dramatic pose. Something, again, uh, this is often known only to the offender because this is a dark fantasy that will have been... um, sort of incubating and festering for for years in many cases and only they know the importance of it but it's very interesting that we see the escalation from the first victim with this coffin funereal pose to something overtly humiliating in in death and you have what we call uh, foreign object penetration which is again whether it's an object in the mouth or the throat um, most commonly or or in another orifice is uh, typically associated with both necrophiles and, and sadists, particularly if the object is inserted while the victim is still alive. And that's so, called peakerism, right? Peakerism is actually the um, sexual arousal from repeated penetration, uh, usually stabbing, but it could involve uh, any type of, of insertion, the idea of something being in, in, the, in the body, penetrating the body, exactly. And this, and, and, you know, in doing a lot of this, of what he did, I I almost, sometimes I have to think about, um, 
you know, what the, what the motive is. And like, you're not always going to figure it out. It could be an opportunity. And then it turned into something that he just loved doing, or, you know, did he, did he fantasize about killing women? Um, you know, I, I don't know, but he definitely really, really got off on beating the system and working with police officers and feeling like he was above them. Because if I can't be you, I'm going to supersede you. And how can I do that? I can, you know, I'm going to do what I'm going to do and I'm going to send a message. And then when all of you are scampering around trying to figure out what I did, I'm just going to sit back and laugh. And even in court, I, I, I was listening to the court proceedings and I was, and I sat in his mind for a second. Like I'm, I'm accused of this crime. I know I did it, but my narcissism is going to tell me that I didn't. And I'm going to create a story in my own brain that I'm going to start believing Right. And, and now that I've already uh, beat the system, get to beat it a little bit more. But I feel like when they when Douglas was in in court was going against for Pago when he was talking about the staging versus the posing and um, and all this was going down. I couldn't help but think to myself, like, wow, they're going back and forth and and guessing as to whether or not one is right or the other and and how he was probably sitting there and just taking that in and just laughing at 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 the both of them like you know it's not even anything of what you two are thinking it's not even remotely close or you know and i feel like he that that emulated through his life just feeling like he could get away with things or feeling like he couldn't fit into society so he was going to beat society and, and it was a huge thing in my mind as I was looking through this and even even through the victims, because I'm not even sure these victims really had a, any kind of um, bad relationship with him. You know, I think that he just saw it as an, an opportunity and I could be completely wrong, but you can correct me. I just at the moment, they were just the people that he he had chosen because I'm not sure there was anything specific that he went after them with. Right. So, I mean, we're going to be talking about uh, victim selection, which is, forms part of a, a, a sort of a sub-discipline in criminology called victimology uh, and what victims have in common uh, with respect to particular types of offenders. But yeah, the, I mean, these were random victims. So, I mean, there's, a, there's a, a, a number of categories, strangers, targeted strangers who are typically stalked first, acquaintances, you know, friends. These were strangers. And... Um, this is again common among necrophiles and sadists again in that uh, they I mean he was reasonably selective in terms of where he went to try to acquire these victims but what's terrifying about uh, necrophiles and sadistic necrophiles um, is that really just a warm body to terrorize and mutilate and pose I mean that's sex for them that's their sexual orientation they, they, they have no uh, sort of identity otherwise. It's causing pain, terror, humiliation, uh, and degrading the dead um, after these murders further. That's, that's their hard wiring. That's their, and that, that can't be undone, which is why Roy Hazelwood, who aside from John Douglas and Robert Ressler's, you know, was among the original pioneers of what used to be called criminal profiling, now criminal investigative analysis. Uh, he said, I mean, necrophiles, uh, pedophiles and, and sadists in particular cannot be corrected or rehabilitated because you cannot, if you're that far gone, you cannot be brought back to, uh, you know, respecting life and, and you know, consent and, and things of that nature. So, um, I mean, if, if you're sexually excited by terrorizing and mutilating somebody, how, how do you go from that to being able to, to function in, in society? It just, it, it can't be undone. It's written in the DNA. I that's right. That's right. It's the part of their hard wiring. It's just the, the plaster is set. So um, it's, it's just, inter it's, we should be thankful that he was caught after three because someone like this doesn't stop. And that's going to be a case. Uh, we've got a number of, of cases that are going to disturb listeners. But again, we don't tell these stories in order to just engage in gratuitous, gory storytelling or to frighten people. The idea is that people can learn uh, from this, including investigators or, or future investigators, so which include my students and your students who are, you know, in criminology and taking true crime courses. So um, that's probably a good spot to wrap up. What I will say is next week um, we're going to have we're going to be profiling an offender that is even lesser known, and 
whose total number of victims we'll likely never know. And I can guarantee you, I think I know among my criminology colleagues around the world, law enforcement colleagues around the world, I think I've met one person who has heard of this particular individual. And again, we talk about things like petty crimes as precursors or as, in met, and we'll, we'll talk more about this next week, petty crimes are often used as sort of afterglow offenses, for lack of a better word, after these killers commit their crimes and they're still sort of, they have that sexual rush, but they, they, they're not organized enough to find a new victim. They don't necessarily want to kill again. We know that um, everything from shoplifting to fire starting to bank robbery tend to be these afterglow offenses. And this really hopefully opens up and sheds light on the fact that uh, there is no such thing as a petty property crime. Often it goes hand in hand with something more sinister, including murder. The thrill. Definitely. Well, Michael, I think this is a good place to wrap up for today. Um, it's always a pleasure having you as a co-host and your knowledge and everything you have to offer. Um, so I'm looking forward to the next episode. Hopefully the listeners are doing the same. Um, can't wait to see who it is you're going to introduce me to next. <laughs> well, get ready because this is, uh, and this is one we could talk about for days, but we'll, we'll try to keep it uh, short and sweet like today. So okay. good to see you as always, Don. Okay. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Dawn Washburn with my co-host, Dr. Michael Arntfield. See you next time on Suspect Zero. In the next episode of Suspect Zero, the case of the Springfield Three.